going on a big name celebrity podcast, yeah. everybody's trying to grow their audience. So, <laughs> so you reciprocate um, each other. And you want to always invite them on yours if they invite you on theirs. And you want to always try to go on theirs if, if you can. It's pretty good. I can get down with that. So we're live on Facebook. Let's share it up. Share it up, simple room. Six, seven, seven. Oh, don't be saying stuff out loud like that. <laughs> <laughs> Giving people's personal information. All right. Facebook, welcome in. Winning cures everything. You yeah. know how this goes. Da, da, da. All right, let's do this bad boy. What I haven't done is shared out on Facebook yet, so I should probably do we'll that. We'll start the intro, and then we can. That takes a while. That's a good point. Let's see. Let's get the uh, my bookie stuff. I'm Gary Seegers. Oh. Nope, we're not going to do that yet. How about we press record first? We're going to try and record this thing like professionals. I'm Gary Seegers. Catch me on Twitter at GaryWCE. And I'm Chris Giannini. Follow me at Chris B. Giannini. And this is the Winning Cures Everything podcast from winningcureseverything.com. Before we get started, please subscribe to the podcast, share it, and review it. We cannot stress how important those reviews are for iTunes rankings, so help us out. Those of us who love this sport live for nights like this. You are looking live at the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. Can you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. 40, 40 years. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no. This is Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Hello, hello, welcome in. Winning Cures Everything, number 187. It is the Wednesday, January 17th edition of the show. I'm Gary. I'm Chris. On tonight's show, we have got so much stuff going on. We've got Dr. David Ridpath coming in. We're going to talk about academic integrity. We're going to talk about uh, the college football playoff revenue system. All sorts of different stuff with him we will get into. Um, we are going to talk about the possibility of Hugh Freeze joining the staff at Alabama. We are going to talk uh, the NFL playoffs. We're going to talk about Tubby Smith. We're going to, I mean, we're going to talk all sorts of stuff. Just all different kinds of everything. Uh, and I am looking forward to it. I, I'll be completely honest with you. So, uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. First off, Chris, you're going to Vegas this weekend, right? I am. Tell me how that came about. We're going to talk more about it later, but I, I want to know how this happened. Uh, sitting at the house, um, iced in, snowed in, bored, and uh, the wife found from an airline uh, really cheap tickets and said, hey, would you be interested in getting a friend to go? And I said, well, I'm, I'm always interested to go. Originally thought about going after the Super Bowl. Would love to one day go during the Super Bowl. And, uh, and and experience that in Vegas, but with both of my children having birthdays around that time, probably not going to happen until they are substantially older. And so um, I was thinking afterwards, and then you kind of put the bug in my ear that hey, it'd probably be better. Wouldn't it be the fun weekend before the weekend before because you get two games, not just the Super Bowl, but you get both games. If we go this weekend, you know your Pats are in it because they're already in it. Well, and on top of that, you've also got. Um, you, you've got a place to sit, right? During the Super Bowl out there, it's yes. bananas. Conference championship games, maybe not so much. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, I mean, you the hotel room is crazy cheap. Yeah. And uh, and the airfare was, was really cheap. Um, and so it was it was super last minute. Got a buddy of mine that is available and uh, has the income to go. And he said, let's go. I like it. The wife's suggestion. How great is that? I like that. I, I like your wife a lot. You know that? <laughs> a whole bunch. I like her, too. Let's uh, let's go ahead and bring in Dr. David Ridpath. Da -da -da. We're going to call him up on the Skype line. Da -da -da. Let's see. This is Dave. Hey, Dave. It's Gary and Chris from Winning Cures Everything. How are you? Good. How you doing, Gary? Oh, cannot complain. I apologize for getting to you a little later than we anticipated. Uh, let me go on and intro you in here. Uh, it, we've got Dr. David Ridpath here with us. He's an associate professor of sport management at Ohio University, the president of the Drake Group, 
uh, which was put together to help end academic corruption in college sports. You can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Ridpath, Dr. Ridpath. Uh, Dr. Ridpath, first off, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and join the show with us tonight. Uh, yeah, Gary, Chris, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, now I, I invited you on to discuss the college football playoff revenue sharing system and whatnot, but uh, before we jump into that, since this is your first time on and, and we have not had an opportunity to talk to you about this, um, I, I want to talk to you about the uh, the most recent ho- uh, high-profile NCAA cases. Like, I, I wanted to hear your opinion on these along with a couple other topics. The The North Carolina athletics program was able to escape NCAA punishment at, due to the fact that all students, and, and not just athletes, could take a questionable course. And then down here, uh, we're based in Memphis, we're really close to Ole Miss, Ole Miss had several athletic programs punished due in part to, uh, to fraudulent ACT scores that enabled students to enroll that were not academically eligible. How big of a topic were these within the Drake group? And looking specifically at the Ole Miss situation, the university believes that because of the personal offenders that, that aided in faking the ACT scores, since they have already been punished, they believe the football program itself should not endure any penalties. Like, What are, what are your thoughts on these two cases? Well, several. I mean, you know, first off, I, I think, you know, there are many inconsistencies and, and variabilities with regards to uh, NCAA uh, infractions and, and certainly in the, infor- in the enforcement process. I've been through it myself, worked in college athletics and, and have seen it up close and personal and have also done some research uh, uh, on this process. So I, I think first uh, you have to understand that it's not a fair process and it's certainly – isn't one that follows any type of judicial measures that you may see in our own judicial system. Um, specifically speaking to uh, Ole Miss in North Carolina and, and talking about North Carolina first, I was quite vocal that under current NCAA rules, the way that I believe they're interpreted and in keeping with how other schools have been punished, that North Carolina absolutely uh, should have been punished. I don't believe that what happened at North Carolina went on for almost 20 years would not have happened to the extent it did, but for the benefit to athletics and athletics eligibility. Now getting to old Miss, obviously we know these things go on and we know that there are people trying to do fraudulent SAT scores. You say you're in Memphis, we can go back to Derek Rose. Oh, yeah. I mean, these things are going on at many, many schools. And I think we have to look at a larger issue. And this is what we talk about in the Drake group. We have to decide what we want to be with regards to college athletics. Do we want it to be an educational extracurricular activity, or do we want it to be about elite development, winning, and revenue generation? It's very difficult, if not impossible, to do both. So that's really what we have to look at. So our our approach in the Drake Group is if we have a system where we want education to be first, then there's a way to do that. And certainly, you can go to our website at www.thedrakegroup.org and see our plan. And we certainly have a plan that I believe that people often say is what they want college athletics to be about. But saying it and doing it are are two different things. And we have to make a decision. We either have to do college athletics as they are supposed to be, or let's just call it what it is and – pay the players let's let's just have a have a free-for-all because at the end of the day uh gary i tell you i believe that we'll watch under any circumstance we really don't care as fans so for me and for us in the great group we just don't want to have a facade there's a way to do it right there's a way to change the college athletic system for the better we just have to want to do it and i'm not convinced that we actually want to do it and i say we i mean everybody the fans presidents students, administrators, whoever it may be. And if that's the case, then let's not lie about it anymore. And let's not have situations like North Carolina and make an excuse and say, well, gee whiz, since other students had that same access, we're going to go ahead and say that it really wasn't a violation of NCAA rules. But yet another school where somebody might have a half-page paper written for them gets the book thrown at them. And uh, so I think that um, there's a lot of things that we can do to write the system Uh, our main mantra in the great group is as long as we're not doing what we're doing now, because the system as it flows now doesn't work. Completely agree. Dr. Drake. um, Sorry, (laughs) Dr. (laughs) Dr. um, Ripeth. This is Chris. I want to thank you for coming on. Got a question about the Drake group. Does the great Drake group work more with the NCAA or more with accrediting bodies or 
to oversee the schools or do they work with the individual schools themselves, all three? How do you actually function? Well, it's pretty interesting because, to be honest with you, Chris, we really don't work with anyone. We're independent, and many of those groups that you've mentioned, specifically the NCAA, is either very afraid or very reticent to work with us because we are an outside group that essentially call it what it is. We're not trying to say that, you know, if something happens at North Carolina, we don't sugarcoat it and say, well, gee whiz, you know, because other students got it, it's actually okay when we really know what's going on. And, and honestly, it's a system that's set up to exploit, let's face it, African-American athletes to generate revenue um, off them. And oftentimes we use the excuse of saying, well, you know, these sports support other sports. And at many schools, that's not even true. Uh, but we try to use that as an excuse. So really, a lot of those bodies don't want to work with us. Where we really do work with people, Chris, is individuals, people like Mary Willingham uh, from North Carolina, who is the whistleblower of the North Carolina uh, case. And without Mary Willingham's efforts. We lost him totally. <laughs> I was about to say, is it going to come back? No, that's. I think Skype totally died on us. No, Skype's fine. Dr. Ripath, you still hear us? Nope. Um, his call, uh, he's, yeah. I think he's on his cell phone. He's on his cell phone, so I think his call dropped out. Give us one second, guys. Da -da -da, we will get him back. There we go. I'm not sure what happened there. I, I'm willing to bet his cell phone dropped out. It could have happened. Yeah, somehow I lost you guys. <laughs> yeah, we we lost you. You were right in the middle of telling us about Mary working. Willingham. Yeah, with yeah, Mary Willingham. Yeah, with Mary Willingham, and I apologize that uh, somehow we got disconnected. No, but, no worries. But, but yeah, yeah, but people like Mary Willingham. Those are the those are the ones that we're helping, and even down in in your area, uh, from many years ago, Linda Benzel Myers at the University of Tennessee. Those are the people that we're mainly working with. I can tell you that most schools, most accrediting bodies, and certainly the NCAA. Um, you know, they really don't want change. They're either afraid or you have people where the system works very well for them. I mean, if you're John Calipari, Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, you know, why would you want to change? The system works very well for you um, when you're making millions of dollars. And then it's very easy to kind of sell this facade of what, what college athletics is about and say things like, you know, it's about education, all these other things, and you play on people's I would say kind of worse stereotypes and thinking how expensive the college education is and this is such a great gift, when in reality that's not what's going on. And so we in the Dre group tell that story, and most people don't want to hear that. Now, it, this all kind of plays into the main reason I brought you on, which was to discuss an article that was uh, published by Forbes exactly one year ago today, January 17, 2017, entitled The College Football Playoff and Other NCAA Revenues Are an Exposé of Selfish Interest. Now, you bring up early in the article that the Football Bowl subdivision is the only collegiate championship not owned by the NCAA. Uh, it is instead owned and controlled by the 10 FBS conferences and Notre Dame. The monetary value of that playoff is over $600 million a year, and 75% of that goes to Power 5 conferences along with Notre Dame, while 25% of it goes to the Group of Five conferences, and a little over $2 million is distributed to some FCS conferences. Now, the first question on this, when this television contract is finished in 2025, will we reach a point where the smaller schools have fallen so far behind the Power Five that we're eventually going to have to split the FBS into two separate divisions, basically like we have now with the FCS Division Two and Division Three? Yeah, I mean, I certainly believe that, and, and, and honestly, I know a lot of people say things like, you know, oh my gosh, if we pay college athletes, the, the haves and have-nots will be so far apart. I mean, let's face it. They're already they so are far, far apart. apart. <laughs> yeah, they're far apart right now, and I just use the example of, of being here. I, I'm at a Division One, theoretically FPS football playing school. I love Ohio University. We have great kids here. You know, I go to, I go to all the games. I, I support them. Um, I support the kids, even though I do have issues with the way college athletics is being run. But if you go 70 miles from where I'm standing today, you're standing on the campus of the Ohio State University, and it is not even close, and it will never be close. In fact, I could give $100 million today to Ohio University, and they will still not catch Ohio State. If, uh, and if I just said this is for athletics, it could not catch Ohio State. 
you know, Memphis, you know, as good as you guys have been at, at University of Memphis and many things, and certainly in basketball, you have a better chance. But there's a big difference between Memphis and uh, Tennessee and Alabama yes. and schools that are in that area. And so that gap's not going to be closed. And you're right, it's only going to get worse. And that's really where the problem is in many ways. Of course, there's many problems, but a main problem, as I see it, is the mid-majors trying to be something that they're not and that they never will be and spending money and doing things that really does nothing to enhance their brand, improve their institution. I say, why, why belong if you're an Ohio University or a Memphis? And Memphis certainly has, I would say, an outside chance of getting in the Power Five. But if you're an Ohio University, let's use my school, why would you want to be playing football in a division where you have absolutely no chance under any circumstance to play for a championship? I can tell you that if we went to another division or went to FCS and actually had a chance to play for a championship, it would actually be a better thing for campus, would be more exciting. It wouldn't change anything. In fact, honestly, many people out there don't even realize we're Division I. Um, so why not play at a level you can compete at and actually play for a championship? So uh, I think that what you're saying, uh, Chris, is exactly, and Gary, that is exactly what will happen. Uh, I think the gulf is going to get bigger, but it's not one that's ever going to close. Um, it's only going to get bigger. Now, I, I do want to play devil's advocate on this. Uh, you bring up, you know, why compete at something that, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to compete for a national championship, et cetera. I'll bring up two instances and just see what your opinion is on it. Um, FAU, where Lane Kiffin went last year, since he went to campus, their enrollment has gone up over 35%. Out-of-state enrollment has gone up over 35% to that school. Here at the University of Memphis, ever since they had their first winning season in a decade, back in uh, 2014, I believe, uh, enrollment has gone up over 25%. Is that what these – I would imagine that's what they're trying to do here, right? Um, so what – you know, if the school is trying to use athletics as kind of the front porch – it, would they be able to do that at the FCS level? Um, I, you know, certainly a couple things we have to look at. There's been a lot of research out there, even research that I've done, that, you know, you brought up a couple examples. And, again, I'd have to see the data to see, you know, is football a major driver in that? And it, it very well may be so at FAU and, and at Memphis. And it may be even proven to say, look, you know, this was really – we, we surveyed – Oh, man. But I can tell you for every school that's had that bump, there are numerous schools out there that have had the same type of success and enrollment's gone down uh, from a personal experience. When I was at Marshall uh, going back, it's been about 20 years ago, but when Marshall was really having that run in football, yeah, with Randy were a Moss couple years where, Chad, uh, yeah, Hennigan. with Randy, yeah, Chad Pennington, you know, yeah. And so, and our, our enrollment went down and there's just a lot of variability at play. Were there other things that the campus was doing? When that becomes primarily what you see, and research will tell you this, this happened at Boise State, this happened at Boston College after the Doug Flutie pass. Uh, you might see an initial surge in enrollment and some other intangibles, but typically it flatlines after a year or two. And so I think the biggest thing in those situations is, is there going to be a sustained enrollment? The reason why I bring that up is what usually happens if a school gets those benefits that you speak of, the enrollment, marketing, donations, and fundraising. The problem is, is we don't harness that. We just spend more money, and those benefits go into the arms race, and we really get no net gain, and then we flatline after that. I would say that you know Ohio University has gotten um, you know some bumps from success in basketball that we've had over the years, but we did have a couple years after we went to recent NCAA tournaments where enrollment went down. It's a crapshoot, really. Uh, it's examples like that, though, that college presidents and athletic directors look at and often cite. But look at those trends more over five years, uh, eight years, or ten years, and then what you usually find is it's not that big of a net benefit. I would completely agree with that, from the, especially from the FAU thing. Lane Kipton is a kind of a star, and he's an enigma, and people are intrigued by him, and people are showing up to watch him today, and they're going to show up tomorrow. But you're exactly right. In three years, people aren't going to be traveling to, to, down to Florida to see him if he's still there. Now, on to, on to a different question that has to do with the same thing. 
It seems to me that at some point, with the amount of money that the larger universities are bringing in, thanks to TV contracts, uh, the college football playoff, apparel, et cetera, there will be a way to pay athletes something, at least at the Power Five level. Uh, I don't know that they could do it at FAU and Memphis, et cetera, those two examples, or at Ohio. Um, but at what point does the government step in and amend laws that have allowed them to uh, that have allowed them to keep tax exempt status for so long? Yeah, I think it's uh, you know it's coming. I think you've already seen it in this recent tax bill. There's some some chinks in the armor that with the uh, you know the seat do- the seat donations and some of the other donations you don't get the uh, the 80 percent tax deduction anymore. And, and I can tell you that that schools were fighting that. Uh, as much as they could, and I'm surprised that it was this administration that actually did that. And even try, uh, there was even portions of the bill that wanted to get get rid of stadium subsidies and tax breaks, which is you know certainly kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about. But I do think that it's going to happen. I think the big the biggest uh, kind of Achilles heel for the NCAA and college sports, big time college sports, is that we're trying to justify the non-payment and the amateurism aspect on the fact that they are students. And saying that these students, um, if they're not if they're not actual college students, we won't be interested in watching anymore. And but we treat them as employees. We say one thing, we do another. And but we treat them as employees and doing things like restricting transferring, not letting them earn money off their name, image, and likeness. Um, you know, outside of uh, like any other student outside of uh, of college. Those types of things, just you know, two examples, are really what college athletics is going to kind of fall on their sword. And I think ultimately the courts, the government, public pressure is going to change this. And I keep coming back to, honestly, and I have no scientific data to back this up, but I do speak all around the country and talk about these issues. And I look people in the eye who are diehard Ohio State fans, USC, Alabama, whomever, and I say, just be honest to me, with me. Are you not going to watch the college football playoff if I told you that every one of those players were getting a salary? And I want people to be honest with me, and I can tell you 99%, whether it's reluctant or not, say, you know what, it would, I really wouldn't care. We said that with the Olympics. We've said that, that even with the stipend that athletes get now, that that somehow would change the paradigm and people wouldn't be interested. I really don't buy it. I tend to think we're going to watch no matter what. But, again, it comes back to my initial thing. Do we want it to be about education or do we want it to be, want it to be about elite development, winning and revenue generation? And, and it's not inherently wrong to do that. Just don't lie about it. Well, Chris and I both agree. And it's people that understand the sport. We understand that a lot of these guys are getting paid under the table anyway. Yeah. And, and I have my world has been opened up recently from some connections that I've made that it's no longer hundred dollar handshakes. I mean, these people, if you are a top tier player, five-star recruit go to a big big school and you start four years or three years you're going to leave that school in the upper hundred thousand dollar area six seven eight hundred thousand dollars of non-taxable income that you received under the table i don't know that the players are pushing for for getting paid because i i think they're getting a lot of money now and i know i know some of this for a fact yeah there's a lot and believe me i i've been there worked in the business uh, coach, I, I totally have seen it, seen it myself. And that's what I tell people when, when I do get those ones out there who say, oh, my God, it would ruin college athletics if we, if we pay athletes or let them profit you know, off their commercial likeness and those types of things. But I just laugh and I say, my question is, I always say, as opposed to what? I go, if you're, really outraged by the, if you're really outraged by those things, you wouldn't watch college athletics now. The fact is we would rather just not hear about it. That's it. Right? But – these things are going on, and, and my thing is you bring these things out of the shadows, whether it's gambling, anything. You bring these out of the shadows and put sunshine on it, then it's easier to regulate. Right now there's a unrestricted black market, like you said, like you said, Chris, and uh, it's going to keep going on and growing. Why not just, again, just pay the athletes, and then get that lessens the incentive. It's not perfect, but it is the most fair thing to do unless we actually do treat them as students. And I've always said this, if we really went to an educational model, and I I guess I do want to make a little bit of a plug because I have a book coming out called Alternative Models of Sports Development. Uh, You can go to Amazon right now and pre-order it. And this is one thing I talk about, is if we actually do return to an educational model where education is the focus, there's certainly going to be coaches and athletes that don't want to exist 
in that system under those restrictions. And my response to that is that's fine. Other systems will manifest themselves. And I really do advocate a European style type club sports system in sports where people have that option to say, you know what, I don't want to be under these educational restrictions. I want to go play. I want to make money. I want to compete at a high level. And that's what you can do in Europe. You have those options. We're the only country in the world that does this. And I'm convinced and uh, would like to hear your two on this, that if we had a system like that, and if Alabama and Auburn are still playing or, you know, Memphis and Tennessee are playing, we're still going to watch because there's going to still be some pretty good athletes that are going to play for these college teams under whatever scenario. We really don't care. We're essentially cheering for laundry, right? Correct. We want to see those teams. <laughs> we want to see those teams play. I've always put it down with, with my classes. I say, let's face it. If I took half the room and put you in a Michigan uniform and half the room in Ohio state, and we were the best athletes on those campuses, we're not, that's not going to happen. But if it was, a hundred thousand people are showing up to watch. And I think, you know, we, we put these things in these little boxes of saying that we have to have these elite athletes. We can't let them do these things because we're afraid it's going to somehow destroy this ideal. When at the end of the day, we're probably going to watch under any scenario. And I say, let's give athletes other options. You know, I'm always intrigued by, uh, you know, Tom Brady's agent is, is potentially starting this minor league, minor league football yes, sir. Uh, in, in California. The G League is now offering bigger salaries, you know, so then we can say to athletes, hey, this is the way it's going to be in college. If you don't want to do this, guess what? You've got seven or eight other things you can do, you know, and that's great. Go and maximize your athletic utility when it's at its height. And we can still have college sports like supposedly people want. But if we want it to be like it's really like it really is, that's okay too, but let's just be honest about it. Let's not have any academic tie into it so we don't have things like Ole Miss and North Carolina and all the other things we've talked about. Now let's let's jump into something. Uh, you brought up transfer rules and whatnot just a little bit ago. Uh, there was a report by ESPN's Matt Schick earlier today, uh, quoting from his Twitter, which is at ESPN underscore Schick. Uh, I spoke with an NCAA official this week who was 95% certain transfers will soon be allowed to play immediately in basketball and football. Could be a one-time freebie plus grad transfer option. So, in theory, a student athlete could play for three different schools without sitting out. It, it seems like this has been a long time coming. I've got my doubts on whether or not it, it'll be a good idea. Do you foresee any issues with this, whether from an endless recruiting cycle or from a future pay-for-play standpoint, if the NCAA ever reaches that point? Well, I think what it comes down to is, you know, maybe it's not a good idea. I personally, again, don't think um, that any gloom and doom from it is, is going to be something that will happen. I mean, if an athlete is treated well and likes the school that they're at, they likely will stay. But if an athlete has a chance to improve themselves or get to a better situation, and if coaches are able to job hop, then why shouldn't the athlete? Because at the end of the day, we let other students do that. Now, if we don't want athletes to be able to transfer multiple times, then we need to make them employees. Then we would actually have control over that, right? They'd have, have contractual contracts. obligations. Yeah. And those. Yeah, that's the one way to cure that. But I do think that, as I've always said, what we advocate in the group is – we actually have not come out and said that every athlete should transfer anytime they want to. What we have said is that every athlete on every team should have what most every sport has, and that is a one-time transfer exception. That means that you can transfer at one time with no restrictions. The problem is even sports that have the one-time transfer exception now – you have coaches, and it could be baseball, it could be volleyball, whatever, who then have a right of refusal to say which, which school you can go to. Uh, you can't go to schools we're playing on schedule uh, the next few years. Those are things that are wrong. We're saying give the athlete a one-time transfer, no questions asked, no restrictions. And that means if somebody from Memphis wants to go to Ole Miss, somebody from Michigan wants to go to Ohio State, that's the way it is. They should have that freedom. And then any secondary transfer would be based upon academics. We also say that any graduate transfer should be absolutely no restrictions at all, especially if that kid has graduated and fulfilled their obligation to you. If that, if that kid has an opportunity to go to grad school, whether it's for an athletic or academic reason, they should not be restricted in any way. And those are the real problems with it. And I think if we did something like that, it would be a much better, much more palatable solution. But most coaches 
They want that control. And then my response is, if you want control, then make them employees and pay them. It's, it's really that simple. I completely agree. So I've been beating this drum for years. And my, my problem is not just the blocking of kids wanting to go to certain schools, which I have a huge problem with that. It's these coaches that will get on their high horses. I'm I'm gonna kick a man that Gary loves because I like to push around <laughs> on Nick Saban when he's not here. Um, is he will go to the podium and he will bash kids and he will call them quitters and things of that nature. But he'll also be the first guy out there recruiting some other transfer from another school to get them to come to his school. And if you're going to, you're a grown man with a hundred million dollar contract, and you're going to call a kid a quitter because he thought he was going to get playing time or whatever the reason is that he wants to transfer. He just doesn't like you. He realized you're the biggest jerk on the planet, whatever. He didn't want to play for you anymore and he wants to leave. He should have that right to do so. And for you to be able to go up and, and, and bash him publicly, I have a strong problem with, but then you can also block 40 schools that he can go to. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really ridiculous. I think that there's a very good happy medium that we can go to. But again, if the NCAA and coaches keep resisting coaches like Saban, it will end up being an absolute free-for-all. Now, again, I, I don't think it's going to be that huge of a deal. It, it may be some things that we don't like, and you may see a kid play for four different schools. I actually didn't like it when I was growing up when I loved the NFL when the teams were the same team for 12, 15 years. You know, I'd never <laughs> liked it when, 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 when people were switching teams every other year. Now it's happening, and we've kind of evolved. Uh, but I do think that there's a way to do this. And certainly one of the first things we can do is not have a situation where somebody like Nick Saban on one hand can restrict a student, then on the other hand promise a scholarship to a kid, sit in his home, say, I'm going to take care of you for four or five years, and then they find a prettier girl to take to the dance a year later, and all of a sudden say, I'm going to pull your scholarship. Yeah, they so process them out. Yeah. Yeah, so Nick Saban could say, you know what, Jalen Hurts, really like you. You were really great for us, but guess what? We don't need you anymore. And coaches do that all the time. So now, again, you stop doing things like that. Give the kid a, one, a one-time transfer. Give the kid the ability to get out of a national letter of intent if the coach leaves. There are things that we can do and certainly not restrict graduate transfers. That, to me, is a very common sense thing. And obviously never giving coaches the control to restrict an athlete to go anywhere that they want to go. Bingo. Now, to close out, I'm a father – my daughter is heavily involved in gymnastics. I'm not going to go crazy and believe she'll ever be an Olympian or anything like that, but there is the possibility of her one day receiving an athletic scholarship uh, thanks to this sport. I noticed you tweeting several things about serial sex abuser Larry Nasser sentencing and the numerous stories of sexual abuse inside USA Gymnastics, etc., and while he was at Michigan State uh, University. Now, there are numerous stories about Michigan State, despite repeated warning signs enabling Nasser, and it makes me curious what you believe the role of a university should be in a situation like this, whether there should be any punishment for the school or the individuals that allowed something like this to go on. Well, I certainly think, let me kind of backtrack to even what happened this morning in, in one of my classes. Um, and this probably won't surprise you too. I asked even today, this is very big news. We, we know about it, but I asked college students today, I said, Hey, how many of you remember the Jerry Sandusky Penn State thing that happened five years ago? Everybody in the class raised their hand, 40 students. And I said, how many of you are aware of what's going on with Larry Nasser, Michigan State University, and USA Gymnastics right now? And probably only a third of the class raised their hand. Now, to me, that's really where the disturbing part is, is number one, this is every bit as despicable as the Sandusky situation. Yes. Oh, right. And you have, a, you have a situation that blew up so big because it was Joe Paterno, it was football, it was Penn State. Then you had the NCAA trying to score public relations points piling on that, of course, backfired on them. Um, it's a criminal situation that should be handled by criminal authorities. I believe that there were people, based upon what I know, I'm not an expert on this, I don't know this case as well as I knew the Penn State case, but it does appear that people at Michigan State certainly had reasonable suspicions, and certainly at USA Gymnastics, that this was going on. And whether it was protection or enabling, whatever it may be, a lot, a lot of people dropped the ball, including the president of Michigan State University. And this is what infuriates me. 
President Luana K. Simon at Michigan State was one of the presidents leading the charge against Penn State, wanting them to get the death penalty. President Simon was on the NCAA executive committee and was one of those people in Mark Emmert's ear saying, we've got to do something against, against Penn State, yet she doesn't even have her own house in order. And yet today she's giving out statements saying, well, we had no idea this was going on. Well, that's what people at Penn State said, right? But yet that wasn't accepted. And I do believe there needs to be a criminal investigation. I do think heads need to roll at Penn State, uh, excuse me, at Michigan State. And I think it's pretty despicable. As hard as people went after Penn State, whether it's the media, um, anyone, the NCAA, you're not hearing anything, anything like that with regards to uh, Larry Nasser, Michigan State, and USA Gymnastics. And I just think that's a tragedy. I agree. I agree. And Dr. Rudpath, I appreciate you being here. Uh, he's an associate professor of sport management at Ohio University. He's the president of the Drake Group. You can follow him on Twitter at Dr. Ridpath, Dr. Ridpath. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, call me anytime. And, and sorry we got cut off there, but I really enjoyed it. Thank oh, you. No, absolutely. absolutely. Wait, Wait, when the book comes out, come back. Plug your book one more time. What is it? It is the. It's called Alternative Models of Sport Development. Uh, solutions to prevent an educational and public health crisis. Uh, it is available for pre-order right now on Amazon, and I'm available to come back and talk about it anytime. When uh, when are you expecting it to actually get released? Do you know that the actual book should be released by the end of the month? Okay. Oh, so wonderful! Soon, wonderful. quick. All right. Yeah, we'll have you on to talk about the book once it comes out. We get a chance to uh, look it over. I'm very intrigued Absol in the European model of doing things sports wise i follow soccer close closer than most people around here and uh and, and i i actually think that all the professional levels should just spend their billions of dollars on minor league systems yeah I, there are a lot of things that are done right uh, with 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 regards to development and uh youth sports and things that we have gotten backwards in america and i do think it would be you know, no system's perfect, but I can tell you it would be a huge leap forward if we would do something similar that, uh, that's being done in Europe. I am I am very afraid being a Browns fan of the relegation rule, but uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's the price you have to pay if you want things to be a little better sometimes. I understand, I understand. Good deal. We, Thank you. We appreciate your time. I will be in touch with you, and we'll get you back on to, uh, to talk about that book. All right, thanks so much. All right, take care. Dr. David Ridpath. Sweet. Absolutely. I, he is fantastic. So I've heard him on Paul Feinbaum multiple times. I've read his stuff in Forbes and, and everything else. You're already looking up the uh, the book, aren't you? Yeah. I wanna see, I wanna see. <laughs> Amazon, check it out. Dr. David Ridpath, R-I-D-P-A-T-H. He is absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a bunch there. Uh, go look up some of his articles at Forbes. Uh, I don't believe that he's been writing a whole lot lately, but he's just he's got incredible stories, incredible things to talk about. Um, let's go ahead and jump into into this next uh, topic. I, I first, I want to talk to you about Vegas. All right. Okay. I want to know. What do you want to know? I want to know everything that's going on. You want to know the plan? I want to know. I you want to know. know uh, yeah, I want to know like what's on the docket. What sports book you going to okay. uh, to watch the games? Where are you planning to eat? Where are you planning to play? All right. Tell me the whole thing. Tell me what's up. So we got a room package at Treasure Island. So we're staying on the Strip, Treasure Island. It was super cheap. Um, great location. You're it's actually right. not a bad place. Oh no, it's amazing. I've stayed there before. It's right across the street from the Venetian and Palazzo. So you're in like. The high end area, the Mirage and the Bellagio. The last time I went was at the uh, the Palazzo. Yeah, the the Mirage and the and the and the Bellagio are right there next to you. So you're in an unbelievable location, but you're not paying those prices. Uh, so I like that a lot. And um, when well, you're only going to be there for a few days anyway, my so you're good. Four days, four days. Yep. My theme for the trip. Kind of glad you asked this because I, I was <laughs> thinking about this last night. My theme for the trip is the road to six. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's the road to number six. So the number six is going to play an intricate role in everything that we do. I haven't figured all of that out. I know that I will have six bets working on the game. Um, don't know on what, one game or on, on all of them? Okay. On, on the game. Six on, on all. Okay. No, you know what? No, probably six bets on the Pats game. I'm not going to make six. So you, you have some props and you'll have oh, yeah, all I'll have sorts to get of some. I have to get deal. some props. But uh, 
I, I wanna I wanna shake like six strangers' hands, you know, make them wish me good luck. <laughs> just just weird stuff. Are you uh, wearing your Pats jersey? Oh God, well I don't have a jersey, but I've got a lot of. You, you wearing your you wearing your twelve shirt? You probably yeah. wearing your Captain America shirt, right? I don't know. I've got the goat shirt. I've got a. It's gonna be cold in Vegas too. You know that? Really? The high is like fifty four every day. We're gonna be there. What? The low is like thirty six. So I'm not escaping. I'm, it's I'm escaping be warmer. the freezing weather. Yeah, it'll be warmer here than it will be there. What in yeah. the world? <laughs> yeah. I'm a little, little. You know, I mean, you know, it's okay. That's I can I handle like the fifties. I'm a big I like, boy. I can handle the fifties. That's no, that's ridiculous. No, 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 no. Vegas is still going to be beautiful. It's going to be bright, <laughs> sunny every day. There will be no clouds in the sky. Um, we um. are going to. So my day. We're flying in Saturday evening. We're going to catch a show and 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 just do a quick dinner somewhere. No and, idea what uh, show yet. Yeah, no, I know the show. I'm I'm a little a little nervous about putting this out there. Is this like a musical? No, it? no, okay. it's not a musical. Come on now, <laughs> Come on, Gary, give me a hard time because I like going to musicals. Ain't nothing um, wrong with that, man. It's listen, cool. okay, it's this cool. is this is a little. I'm a little more embarrassed about this than I am musicals. The guy that's going with me happily is is equal to this. We're gonna see four magic shows while we're there. There's nothing I wrong love, with that. I love magic. That's I get they, made fun of for very, very many people in my family and and my friends make fun of me because I like magic. Yeah. I really like magic a lot. Let, let me tell you what what I got made fun of for. Okay, I went to see Carrot Top when I was out there. Okay, now, I love it, it Carrot was a Top. Suggestion. So yeah, I love Carrot we're, Top. We were either going to uh, do comedy yeah. or magic. Um, so I, we're, we're both really like magic. So our first night there, we're going to go see David Copperfield. And uh, and and do that. The next day is Sunday, so it's Games a lot earlier. All day. Hang on. So the game starts two o'clock God's time. All right, <laughs> but that's but that's noon their time. So we're not going to be able to just party it up Saturday night. We're going to wake up. There's a place I got a buddy of mine named Randy lives in Vegas. Suggested a place off strip for brunch. Unbelievable brunch. So we're going to wake up Sunday morning, take an Uber out to go eat brunch, get a good meal in, get all my sixes out of me. Get to the Westgate. Westgate's Westgate. where we're going. Okay. They okay. are supposedly have a big theater that, that you can go into. Yeah, the Westgate has is a game. I've never watched incredible. a game or been in the Westgate Sportsbook. Being somebody that loves the Super Contest, I follow it religiously. I know that that's kind of the mecca of sports gambling. Um, so I'm pretty excited to watch. And we're going to spend the whole day at the Westgate. We need a big brunch, do that. And then uh, when both the games are over with, I got dinner at a uh, one of the – Prime Steakhouses in uh, the Bellagio. Okay, overlooking okay. the fountains. It'll be nice. The Westgate is is awesome. Um, the one over at the Venetian, where the CG Technologies mm-hmm. is headquartered. I was there for uh, a college football Saturday. Watched uh, some games there. Watched games at the Hard Rock. Uh, that was nice. The MGM was great. Um, so I've never yeah. I've never been in the MGM. So when we go see David Copperfield, we will. And I've never been there for a sports event. Every time all I'm of gone, these sports books are off, insane. Off, off time. I mean, so well, you you'll have to go and check out at least a. Um, you'll have to go check out like an NBA game, just something to see some some action going down, um, because it, it's just. Well, I'm going to be there world. for for several days. The two biggest games of the week. Yeah, but you're only going to be at one book for those. That's all I need. I'm going to be at the best book. Like, I'm going to be at the best book. I didn't know if you were going to try and make your way over to uh, South Point, over on the uh, the old side. Uh, we'll go so. to Old Town. We'll go to Old Town to shoot dice, though. That's that's where I go to shoot dice. I can understand that. Um, we, and we really don't know when we'll end up moseying on over there, but but one evening, probably really late. That's kind of how I like to play it. Um, <laughs> and then and then the rest of the week, it's going to be couple of nice dinners. You going to the tequila place to where uh, you and your wife went? So because we're staying at Treasure Island, I will probably find my way to the tequila bar. I was actually looking <laughs> online at their website. They don't, like, you know, like the little, it's just a bar on the wall, back wall of a casino. I don't know if it's still there. Really? Like, I saw a mojito bar online, and I'm like, if they turn my tequila bar into a mojito bar, I'm going to be upset. Now, how anywhere ago, I can go to get tequila. I how long ago anywhere. was this? Oh, geez. That was before the first child was born. Um, so that's been what? That's been six years ago. That was six years ago. So almost what? seven. So, but but it was a couple of years before that. I mean, it's been probably 10 years since my wife and I Ooh, went. Good I gracious. bet that tequila bar is gone. I'll have to, I will find a tequila bar. And, and the reason being is because I get tequila anywhere, but they had like 400 different kinds that were unbelievable and the worst part about going to a place like that 
is all of these names of the tequilas are Spanish. And so, like, I get back, and everybody's like, well, what did you try that was good? I was like, I have no idea. A, I'm like five tequila drinks in, and, and B, like, I didn't know the name when he said it. No, I just, he, he told me what to drink. Yeah. I said, all right. It's not like, like Jim's tequila. I could remember that. Oh, but God. it's some Spanish name and whatever. So. Come on. It's game <laughs> right. day, baby. Wake up or get out. That's right. Let's go. That's right. All right but I'm let's... excited. I've never watched a game in a sports book, being a sports gambler as long as I've been and being so into the football. And I'm going to get to watch the Pats play. Uh Pretty pretty excited about it. I'm pretty excited about the fact that you will be skyping in for the show on Monday. Oh, Monday, Monday, I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna still do the show and uh, we can Skype in and uh, yeah, now, I'm not ab- I'm not quitting the show after the Super Bowl. We will be moving back to a Sunday night Wednesday night format so it can be released on Monday mm-hmm. morning and on Thursday morning. So well, that's keep, the plan right now. That's the plan. Keep an eye out for that. We'll try it. We'll always for at least be a doing bit. at least two days. But yes. we. We will have this two. Things always evolve. We will have two shows per week, at least, no matter what. Yeah, no matter what. So, so anything else you want to? I'm going to the four shows. Are we're going to see David Copperfield? We're going to see Penn and Teller. Who Penn is? Penn Gillette is one of my heroes. Love that guy. I haven't read a lot of books in my life. Uh, I've, I've read uh, Penn's book. Do you and, listen to his uh, podcast? I do listen to his podcast a lot. Any part of the Corolla? Yeah, thing? he's part of the Podcast One family. Okay, absolutely. Open up. Open up. I uh, no. I have not listened to it. I, I'm I was always curious in it, but I never listened to it's it. It's different. It's different, but he'll make you think. I'm interested. So in I'm, that. I'm a fan of his. Uh, so we're going to see him. We're going to see Piff the Magic Dragon. Piff. Hey, he's a guy that was on America's Got Talent. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. And he has teamed up with Penn and Teller on a bunch of stuff. Okay. Uh, so he's close to them. And then there's like an afternoon show that we're going to go to called Max Comedy magic or something my buddy i'm going with has already seen that show and he said it was really funny it's crazy cheap and it's something to kill time in the middle of the day i can get down with that so anyway keep us out of trouble <laughs> like you'll be able to do that for like two hours all right let's uh let's talk some sports for a little bit uh hugh freeze interviewed for a staff position with nick saban at alabama on monday obviously there's a lot of interest in it because uh, brian dable the team's offensive coordinator left the school on monday to become the offensive coordinator for the buffalo bills Freeze's interview is said to have been for a staff position. Uh, he will not be the offensive coordinator. It appears that that position has gone to Mike Loxley, who was already the co-OC. Uh, I do, suppose. Do you think that he was interviewing for the offensive coordinator position? Is this the first time? No, ever Nick, I don't believe that. You don't think Nick? This is the first time Nick's ever been told. No. Well, that's what I was going to get into. There's a report from Aaron Suttles at the Tuscaloosa News that Saban is really pushing for his hiring. According to Suttles' story, uh, he and I quote, another aspect of this is that should Alabama decide to hire Freeze as an on-the-field coach, it would likely need the blessing of SEC Commissioner uh, Greg Sankey. Now, Sankey isn't keen on that happening, the Tuscaloosa News has learned. That doesn't omit what everybody thought he was going to be anyway, which is an offensive analyst. God almighty. So, basically, he just wants a job. That's what Freeze wants, is just a job. I don't know that the league has ever told Nick Saban, no, you cannot hire a coach. Nobody's ever told I'm, Nick. No. I am surprised that that Lane Kiffin was not blocked initially. No one's ever told Nick no. Do you? How do you feel about this? Not, not from a Hugh Freeze joining Alabama standpoint, but from... Uh, Hugh Freeze being blacklisted by the SEC. How do you yeah, feel about that? It's just the nature of the business. I have. There's no question in my mind that if Mike Sly was the coach, he wouldn't have got this interview. You don't think he so? He would have never even got that far. Mike or Sly, if Mike Sly was the, the, the commissioner. The commissioner. Mike Sly was a strong, living and breathing commissioner. Greg Sankey is a spineless, absent, op, whatever, absentee commissioner. Dang. I just I going don't, in hard on Sankey, but I've I've been this my whole ever since he's had the job. Everything he touches, he screws up. Well, I think if if you're going to blacklist him, you let all these conferences or uh, all these teams know. Look, you cannot hire this guy. Like, send out a memo. My, Tell everybody what's up. My but concern, I wonder. My concern is this: Alabama has all these analysts. See, this is why I hate the analyst part. Is, is Alabama has all these analysts. Well, other schools have some analysts, but not enough, and they don't pay them nearly what Alabama pays them. And so Missouri wanted to talk to him. Tennessee wanted to talk to him. Well, if Sankey put the kibosh on those, 
and Alabama's like, well, we'll talk to him. We're going to hire him for one of these analyst positions. Those other two schools don't have that ability or that flexibility because of their setup, their makeup. They have to answer to presidents. They have to answer to all these other people. And, and they just don't run their school that way. That's where I have a problem of all things not being equal. I, I, we need to draw a roll in the sand and say, this is what you can have and this is what you can't have. Yeah, the analyst thing I think does need to be touched on. Um, they, These guys are coaches. No, Nobody I, I in the world this. would ever call Hugh Freeze anything other than a coach. He's a damn coach. Agreed. But because you're going to say, well, he's not going to have any contact with the kids, doesn't matter. He's still a coach. And you're he's still involved in, in, in the, the game plan. Yes. So you're still hiring another coach. The NCAA today did – now, they had to table it, but – it, it had more to do with the recruiting than analysts. But it is something that they are looking into because at some point there has to be a limit, right? Yes. So, like, they're tabling this whole thing about how many staff members can actually recruit. Uh, right now, I think it's, like, 30 different staff members can be involved on, like, recruiting weekends, right? And they I, can, they can actually the contact is, recruits. I just wish it was – I'm not saying that I have a problem with there being unlimited numbers. That's fine. But let's not play this game of semantics yeah. and say, well, we're just going to call him something different. And then, no, he is, he is a, he's, he's been a head coach. He's been a quarterback coach. He's been a coordinator. He's been all these things. If he's going to go backwards, he's not going to go to a non-coaching position. He's not a graduate assistant. Well, you, you say that, but Steve Sarkeesian was a head coach at USC. I get it. I didn't and like he the was Sark. also I know. But I, know, I didn't I, like that either. But he, he also took that and turned it into an offensive coordinator position at Alabama first and then in the NFL. So like but it's, he, it's the basically, NFL is irrelevant. The NFL thing is irrelevant. Because he could have immediately went to the he would have gotten the NFL gig had he never went to Alabama to be the analyst. You sure? Yes. Yes. Know, he man. absolutely would have interviewed for that job. Look, could have interviewed for that job and still gotten that there job. There is a reason why these guys go to Alabama. It, it is turned into coaching rehab. And I don't understand it. I don't necessarily I'd like see, it. I disagree with that completely. It's not coaching rehab. He he gets the benefit of getting these ultra-talented people that have screwed up royally that everybody else says, we're not touching. And Nick says, I'll take them. I'll take anybody. I don't yeah, care. Especially if you've got them in an off-the-field yeah. role. I'll t- so, you know, you, you can and, pick and the that, brain therein, and get ideas. Therein lies the, th- the thought process. Is should I, do I think Nick should be penalized for not taking people that nobody else would take? No, that's not my issue. The Lane Kipton hire I didn't have a problem with. Nobody else would touch him. Nick hires him. Congratulations. No, no big deal. I don't have a problem with that. And I don't have a problem with somebody hiring Hugh. But there is no question that Tennessee wanted Hugh and that Missouri wanted Hugh. And they were both told by the SEC, No. Didn't even get an interview with those guys, and it's well, because we don't, we don't know power, that he didn't get because Nick is more powerful. Oh no, no, no! We would have, I promise you, the world would have known if you got an interview. No, you're probably right. right. Because Nick is more powerful than those two head coaches, he gets to say, "Oh, I'm gonna talk to him, and I'm gonna bring him in, and he's gonna make somebody super duper high up say, no, you can't.' And then he's gonna put him in this other position that still allows him to be just as valuable as he normally would, but." We get to call him something different, and they don't control that. That's my that's my problem with the system. This is not Alabama hate. This is not Nick hate. It could be any school in the country. I know LSU has an uh, analyst, but but this is this is my problem with the system. It is it is not set up. To, it, it is totally set up to where you have the haves and the have nots, even within the big boys. Agree. Even within the Power Five, we let Ohio State and we let Alabama. Because of Nick Saban and Urban Meyer. Yeah, if those two guys were at two different schools, they would still be allowed to play by different rules, and Alabama would be made to play by separate rules. I believe that with all of my heart because I've watched it happen. Kevin Sumlin was hired at the University of Arizona. It's a good hire. Now, they fired Rich Rodriguez. Does this move surprise you at all that Sumlin jumped in this quick? Oh, no, 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 no. You think, think he just really wanted to be a head coach? No, no, no. He wanted to be a head coach. He deserved to be a head coach. He absolutely deserves to be a head coach. I don't know that he should have been fired. I think that Arizona made a better hire than Arizona State did. Oh, oh. <laughs> and Arizona State had a, a big-time jump on him. Yeah, this is no question. No question in my eyes. No question this is a better hire. <laughs> All right, the uh, the University of Memphis football team has what appears to be their new starting quarterback for 
the 2018 football season. His name is Brady White. He's a grad transfer from Arizona State. Uh, this was the number 68 overall player in the class of 2015. How bananas is that? He was recruited by Mike Norvell to Arizona State. There are now three kids named Brady at the quarterback position at Memphis. That's that's a pretty good name. Yep, Brady White, who we just mentioned, Brady Davis, who was the third string quarterback this past season, and Brady McBride, a three star quarterback from Texas, who was in this year's recruiting class. Uh, have you seen this kid? Yeah, we saw it yesterday. <laughs> this is an attractive dude. Yeah, he's a good looking man. Now, I, and I showed the picture to my wife, and yep. I said, "Good gracious, can you imagine what this kid's going to be like on this campus?" Yeah. So he he looks like he should be on like the Disney Channel or something. Coeds in Memphis are going to absolutely eat this dude alive. And and you were talking earlier about the talent that's in Arizona, Arizona State. State. Hey, look, well, he, I understand he, he left he left a place with some pretty strong talent. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Um, <laughs> Rick said just like the Pats, he's talking about the Alabama stuff, I know. the haves and the have nots. Um, they all play by the same rules in in the, in the NFL: hard hard salary cap. Well, I mean, they kind of got a salary cap in college. Oh, right? that's, so, that's <laughs> such bull. That is such bull. All right, let's talk about Tubby Smith for just a second. Uh, Positively about Tubby it, Smith. Positive okay. about Tubby, but then I'm going to talk about something else, too. Okay. Tubby Smith and the Memphis Tigers beat UConn last night 73-49. to uh, It was their fourth straight American Conference win. Uh, did you realize that that has never been done at Memphis? They won four in a straight in four, conference? Four straight in conference uh, in, in the American in Conference. In the American I was going to say because so it's neither, Cal, neither Josh Cal Passner. Yeah, neither Josh Passner nor Tubby Smith has ever won four straight in conference. Now, we can talk Memphis and what Tubby's been able to do with this roster so far and whatnot. They've got a stretch in February that's going to show you exactly what they're made of because they got Wichita State and Cincinnati and Tulsa and like all the all this different the, – the great teams, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so you'll have to wait till February to figure out exactly what they are. But let's talk about UConn coach Kevin Ollie, right? This dude was an absolute superstar. He was – Rumored for a bunch of NBA jobs after he won a national championship in his second season. Let's look at what he's done overall. He's 123 and 68. That's a 64.4% winning percentage. He's only 55 and 40 in conference play in six years. And he has only made the NCAA tournament twice in five seasons. And it doesn't look like he's going to make it in the sixth. Yeah, I was about to say, he's probably not going to make it this year. He went 16 and 17 last year. Not a lot of that's because of injuries and whatnot. Um, and he's ten and seven this year. Is UConn okay with mediocrity? I don't think so. I mean that that basketball program was absolutely rolling under Jim Calhoun. Yeah. It, he ended up getting busted for NCAA violations and he retired. Um, they had a postseason ban in all his first year, but I mean they went twenty and ten. I, they, they were on the bubble, one way or the other. Um, he won the national championship in his second season as a seven seed. At what point are they going to look to hire somebody else? I bet, I'm I'm quite certain he's on the hot seat now. I mean he's he's got to be right. Yeah. Like how how much I don't follow. I mean I preface this by saying I don't follow college basketball very closely anyway. But if I you look at this the same way that you look at college football, then yeah. then look at it that way. That's right. Oh yeah, I'm smart enough to know that I, these colleges don't like mediocrity. They don't like losing. No. So and that's that's where I'm getting at. And on you this lose is, to a guy that's been trashed and bashed and has absolutely no quote unquote talent as opposed to recruiting levels and things like that and tubby smith and this memphis team that's not good now the the fun thing is you can always say that tubby smith is a hell of a coach right but you he can is. always say that he absolutely is and we we talked about that when he got hired on it was gonna take a while because he had to get his kind of kids in but losing by 24 to this memphis team oh that's bad is not a good thing that's bad not a good thing we don't have a single player that's gonna play in the league I, we don't have many that could play in the G League. All right, before we get into uh, the NFL stuff, the College Football Playoff Selection Committee has a new chairperson. His name is Rob Mullins, the athletics director at Oregon. A confident young man, a superb athlete. He replaces Texas Tech AD Kirby Hocutt, whose two-year term is expiring February 1st. There are other new faces on the committee. Oklahoma AD Joe Castiglione. Former journalist, current journalism professor, Paola Boivin. I'm hoping I said that right. I'm certain that's probably wrong. Probably wrong. Former <laughs> Rice, Clemson, Arkansas, and Air Force head coach, Ken Hatfield. We know him from having uh, Barney Farrar on the staff with him at multiple places. College and NFL Hall of Famer, Ronnie Lott. Georgia Tech AD, Todd Stansberry. And Florida Athletic Director, Scott Strickland. 
Uh, here are the uh, the members that are leaving after February along with Hokut. They are Clemson AD Dan uh, Radakovich. Probably said that wrong, too. Former Arkansas AD Jeff Long. Former NCAA executive Tom Jernstedt. Former Stanford, Notre Dame, and Washington head coach Tyrone Willingham. Former Vandy head coach Bobby Johnson. And former journalist Steve Weiberg. This brings the committee back to a dozen voters along with Mullen. Now, they were down one because of a chairperson stepping down in the middle of last season. Does this change anything at all? I, I don't know who any of these people are. No. I don't think it does either. No. I don't, you, I'm you going to tell you this. The powers that be that control big boy college football are not the 12 people in that room. And it's I ESPN. Think, and I think those people are told what to do. I think it's ESPN. Yeah. I, I 100% think that's it. And they might not be told what to do directly. It could be a lot of indirectly. <clears throat> years ago, there was, golly, this is probably seven or eight years ago, I, I was watching ESPN, and there was this the, either SI article or ESPN article that, that talked about power in sports and, like, who are the most powerful people in sports. Yeah. And, and one of the group of people were the group of people on college game day. And, like, you had a lot of, like, presidents, like Fox Sports president and, and the president of ESPN and, and, like, people that run these – sports media industries, yeah. the president of SI. But no, like one of the highest ones up there were the the college game day goods. And the reason they were so high up is is they actually control rankings. Yes. If they say over and over and over again a team is supposed to be good, sports writers and other coaching polls and all of these ways that, that we vote on these guys and who's good and who's not, listen to them. Yeah, and if they continually tell you this team's better than this team, this team's better than this team, then then they are telling the world what the ranking should be. And if a ranking comes out that's different than them, they'll call it out and say it's wrong. But they have such a platform and such well, a, I mean, they a base of fans over two million people yeah. watching per show. It, it, like every college football right. fan turns well, then, on their TV but, and watches that right off the bat. Even if you don't watch it live. You, you're watching it throughout the week, and you get the clip of Herbie saying this team's supposed to be this, and Fowler yeah. all those times saying this guy's supposed to be here and this guy's supposed to be here and all this other stuff. They control the outcome of rankings. I think that's indirectly. I don't think that's manipulated. I don't think they're they're trying to do anything. But those guys tell the committee what's supposed to happen, and I think the committee listens to them. I think you're probably right. I'm not, as much as I like that show and I love listening to those guys, I wish there was a way to take their voice out of it and let people independently watch these games without any other influence. I mean, that's not possible. Well, you remember FS1 had a um, FS1 had a morning show they that tried was trying to, go to compete against with it. Yeah. And it, it had, what, Clay Travis and yeah. Robert Smith and somebody else on it. But it, it, it still a lot of it would have been the same narrative, I think. Yeah. So, it, it, now, obviously, a lot of it has to do with tie-ins, right? But if you've ever sat and watched College Game Day, they are not biased to a nope. particular conference. Nope. I, I, don't, I don't believe they're biased. I think all those guys are great at what they do. I absolutely don't think there's any manipulation in there. I think Herbie, being the Buckeye alum, you know, played there and all that stuff, I think he does an unbelievable – this is a guy that hates Ohio State – Thinks, I think he does a very good job of separating his fandom from what he really believes and thinks. Yes. And and I have a strong appreciation for that. I don't think it's their fault, but I'm, I don't but know how But they have to, such a huge platform I think that they it's have, impossible to get so away from. I think they're so good at what they do. People listen to them, and and they, they don't watch the game for themselves so much. Or yeah. they watch the game with this skew that, well, this team is supposed to be better than this team. Yeah. And so if they lose, something had to happen that that's not right. Or there there's some anomaly in here that we're not factoring in. Yes. And and you start making excuses and whatnot. And I don't know, man. I I don't know that those twelve people in that room matter. I think you're probably right. That's it I saw the it was an interesting topic to hit on because of all the changeover. But at the same time I saw it and went, None of this matters. Nope. Doesn't matter the conference affiliation. 
Doesn't matter that Ronnie Lott's coming in. Doesn't matter that so and so's leaving. Like, it's going to be the same thing every time, no matter what. Because when it gets down to that last Saturday, yep. like the rankings, the whole rest of the time can be fine. But they have shown you that they can change whatever they want to change at the last minute for no reason. Sure. Absolutely no reason. All right, you know what time it is. Uh, let's talk some NFL. Uh, let's get ready to rumble. NFL playoffs talk, baby. Let's do this. All right, first off, Todd Haley is out as the offensive coordinator with the Steelers. Does this surprise you at all? Yes. I was surprised as well. Yes. Now, tell me this other part. And I completely disagree with it, too. Should Mike Tomlin be on the hot seat next season? Oh, hell yeah. You think so? Yeah, hell yeah. I watched the way he... I watched the way he coached the last three minutes of that ball game. That's a fireable offense. He works for the most stable organization on the planet. Yes. Which is why he's not getting fired. But that's the I only agree. reason why he's not getting fired. Well, it's because they don't believe in firing people like, like that. But, but the, I'm going to tell you decision. this. That's a fireable offense. You cannot blame the offensive coordinator who put up 42 points against one of the best defenses in the country and you lost that game. Why didn't you fire the defensive coordinator? Agreed. That's what I want to know. Oh, Mike Tomlin, you coach on the defensive side of the ball. You were the defensive coordinator that got the head coaching job. You're supposed to be good at this part and overlook that guy. You could overrule that guy. The offense has always been good. The offense is what has won games for them. The fact that Since they gave Tomlin up, took over. The fact that they gave up 45 points to, to Blake the Jags Royals. This a, is an absolute travesty. It it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Um, the Jets fired their offensive coordinator. That doesn't surprise me. Doesn't surprise you? No. That's. I, I think they've got a good head coach there. Oh, no. I, th I do think he's a good coach. God, what he did this year. I'm going to tell you this. What's his name? I should know his name. I, I knew his name at the beginning of the season. <laughs> I don't um, remember. He was he was the defensive coordinator from Arizona when he came over and when that when Arizona had that super elite defense and they never got back to good after he left no. anyway. Um but him and the coach at the Bills, those guys are Sean McVay. No, Sean McDermott. McVay oh, McVay is, is in, uh, in LA. LA. Yeah, it's because yeah. two Sean's. Two Sean's yeah. Jumping in at the same time. Got, got a lot of got a lot of Sean's at the head coach. Yeah, no. Um, but anyway, I can't remember I can't remember his name. But anyway, both those guys have done a really good job. I expected both those teams to be garbage. Yeah. The people and they were, were thinking the but. Jets were gonna not win a game all year. And instead they, and they won look, like six. Yeah. It's pretty insane. That's a, it's unbelievable. And then and then what the Bills did, they made when, the and, playoffs. And the Jets fans are so mad right now because like the place that you don't want to be no, is no, the no. middle I, of the no, pack. This is not the NBA. That's bull. That's total bull. People go you. from the middle of the pack to the playoffs all the time. Well, it's got you, a lot to do with scheduling. You and, don't want to be at draft. the bottom. I disagree with that. The draft in the NFL doesn't matter nearly as much as Well, because any you will sport. always be able to find an impact player no matter what position you were drafting, period. And Look at the Steelers player, last year with One TJ player Watt. cannot change a draft. Exactly. One player cannot change a team. Well, all right, not one player. Now, Carson Wentz with the Eagles. Well, quarterback. A quarterback, quarterback can, yes. But at, at no other point in the, the game can you get a player. They could be the best at what they do outside of quarterback. They cannot make your team win. I think that's what the Jets want, though, right? They want a quarterback. Josh yeah, McGowan but is I not going to be this your is, quarterback. We are seeing now this was the year that you didn't. you ain't tanking for one of these guys. I think you're probably right. We might be wrong when we look back on this because I've been wrong a lot on quarterbacks, but you're not tanking for one of these guys. You you wouldn't think that people would tank for like Mitch Trubisky or for uh, Carson Wentz at the time because we didn't oh, no, know much I, about I'm it. I'm the Browns guy. I wanted them to trade that pick. Yeah, I, didn't, I know. I didn't. I was wrong. I'm dead ass wrong. <laughs> All right, uh, two o five p.m. Central Time on Sunday. Uh, it'll be noon where you are. I'll be, in, yeah, I'll be. CBS. The Jags are plus nine at the Patriots. At, look, Tom Brady missed part of practice today because oh, he hurt his hand. Uh, now, so, can can you say Brian Hoyer AFC Championship MVP? No, no, you, I cannot <laughs> say that. I will not say that. They could cut his hand off. Tommy's playing his game. I don't know who who hurt his hand. I don't know how it hurt. That guy's going up in Cleveland next. Was year. it the throwing hand? Yes, his right hand. Oh my god! That guy's going up in Cleveland. They haven't released what happened. I know this. He spent half of practice in the training room because of his hand. 
That's not a good thing. Especially not against the Jags. We'll be okay. We'll be all right. You're okay. Right. We'll be okay. I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not happy about it. How do you feel about this game? Well, before today, I felt great. That, do you think that they will cover the nine? Oh, yeah. All right, so you think the Pats cover the nine? Yeah. I'm taking the Jags plus nine. You can do that. Let me tell you. Let me let me break this game down and tell you why. Because there's actually logic and not just fandom. Okay. Okay. Because I've been explain to I've you. been very honest about my Patriots. I, yeah. I, I told you earlier in the year take the Bills on the point. So anyway, let me tell you why I think the Pats are going to blow them out. I was actually a little nervous about the Titans because Derrick Henry is such a beast. And, yeah. And they've been so bad against the run. Bill made it abundantly clear. They are we're, not going to be the front of the football. We're going to shut Derek down. And I thought this. Well, he's going to try to, but we don't have the dudes to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> you got the we, dudes. We figure it out. Bill's going to shut it him down. Scheme. If Bill shuts down, if the if the Steelers take out Leonard Fournette, Blake Broyles does not do anywhere close to what Blake did. Yeah. Blake was able to do anything he wanted because Leonard Fournette gashed the hell out of the Steelers. Well, and it wasn't just Fournette. It was everybody. Oh, yeah, everybody. On, it TJ Yeldon, Yeldon did the same thing. Yeah. Gashed him seven, eight yards a touch, ton of touchdowns, all this stuff. Well, and Bortles ran for God knows how many yards. But he's able to run for those yards, and he's able to throw for those yards strictly because the every, safeties had to everybody's be the playing the run. Bill is going to stop the run. He's going to do exactly what he did to Mariota. I'm going to make Marcus beat me. He's going to make Blake beat him. The difference is this. I'm more afraid of Marcus than I am Blake. If I'm going to say a quarterback has to beat you, I think Marcus is more dangerous. What we did to the Titans, I think is going to happen to the Jags. That's that's, that's my only logic and reasoning. I think the Titans are better than Jacksonville offensively. And so offensively, I think they get almost nothing. 14 points max. I was very afraid of the Jacksonville defense the first half of the Steelers game. By the second half, when the Steelers put up 42 points, I think the Patriots yeah. will have no problem scoring at least 25-30. You're probably right. And I do not – Blake had a Blake game of his life. This is not bashing him. He needs to get credit for that. But to ask somebody to do something they've never done in their life two weeks in a row, and the second time he does it, he's going to be doing it against the best defensive mind on the planet. Yeah, I uh, I, I agree with you. I just can't see that happening. I'm trying to look up Blake's numbers from last week. Oh, pretty incredible. And not just rushing, throwing the ball. Pretty incredible. 14 out of 26 for 214 yards and one touchdown, and he ran five times for 35 yards. Leonard Fournette had 25 rushes for 109 yards and three touchdowns. Um, I will say this. He had 82 yards in the first quarter. But that's what put the game. It's, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's what. It's if what he doesn't the do that, the Steelers win by fourteen. Yeah, I agree. There, therein lies my problem with with thinking the Jags can repeat what they did. Yeah, it's almost impossible. If the Jags win this game, or if they cover, it is because that defense shuts the Patriots down, which they're they're not above doing. That could absolutely happen. But you're gonna end up with like a a nine to twelve ball game. Nine to seventeen ball game. You're not gonna have. Yeah, you're probably you're, right. This game, the Jags will not win a forty forty ball game. No, that's, will that's not, not happening. Will not happen. So you you can bet whatever you want to bet. I think the safest bet in this is gonna be the under. Yeah, you probably. I think right. it's what forty five something like that. 46. Yeah, I think it's forty forty six and a half. So I'm not trying mistaken. to get my six bets in. I'll be playing the Pats. I'll be playing the under. I'll probably parlay them. I'll probably tease them. <laughs> all that good I stuff. I got to get 60 in, man. I got to get 60. Well, you, you still got all all sorts of props. I know. I know. Yeah, but you probably don't want to bet props on uh, – I'm not going to bet too many props. Well, just don't bet props on New England because we never know who's going to get the ball. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. You I'd probably you go bet- under on whatever Blake Bortles passing uh, yards, yards should yes. be. Let me tell you the prop you do bet is you say Brandon Bolden the first to score or something of that nature. You pick an obscure dude that hadn't scored all year. Well, and Bolden say, had what three touchdowns against the uh, the Titans? Yeah, but I'm just saying, like that's that's the prop you make. You're not going to find it on there because they just don't have many props. Oh, do they? Oh, I yeah, it's Bovada found. that's got. Yeah, uh, Bovada's the one that's got all the props. All right, all right. So we'll, anyway, we'll worry about. Bovada and I don't know that. I don't. I, I'll be whatever the Westgate has is what I'll be betting. The Westgate. 
God bless the Westgate, man. I love the Westgate. I've never I, been there. I've never darkened the doors. Uh, you, I, I can't wait. Caesars also has a really good one, by the way. You need I've to been, in, I've Caesars. been in Caesars. I've walked through Caesars during like a college, a random college basketball. Yeah. See, you need to you need to check out, like, well, you're not gonna be able to check it out during a football game, but obviously, we'll get there. I got a plan. I got a home. I'm glad you got a plan. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a base. But that's that's my thought process for the game. That's what I think is gonna happen. Um, I think they got to shut down Leonard. I think he's the crux of it all. I think they will probably be able to do that. So. Probably. Now I'm, I'm going to try and pull up the uh, the thing while we're talking about this. Uh, tell me this. Okay. 5.40 p.m. Central Time on Fox. It'll be 3.40 your time in Vegas, in heaven. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> uh, on Fox, the Vikings minus 3.5 at the Eagles. Is this going to be a big-time failing if the Vikings don't get to the Super Bowl? Since Carson Wentz is out, yeah, I think. I, I mean, think if if be, you lose to Nick Foles in the playoffs, I think when you've made it this huge. far, like it's got to be, you it's it's win or nothing, right? Like it, bigger it, bigger disappointment. I sent you this meme earlier. Bigger disappointment. Blowing a twenty five point lead to the Patriots, the best team on the planet in the Super Bowl, or losing the playoff game to Nick Foles, Atlanta. I'm gonna go with the twenty five points. Well, yeah, because that just. That's pretty because it, one, like it's it's the Super Bowl. Two, you got a twenty five point lead with seventeen minutes left. Um, I mean, there's a lot to this, right? But you just let Blake Broyles keep you. I mean, not Blake Broyles. You just, you just let Nick Foles. Nick Foles keep you from getting to another NFC Championship game, or getting to the Super Bowl. Yeah, or getting to the Super Bowl. But yeah, I mean, I mean I, that, you got to go home and say, how the hell did this happen? Yeah, especially after what happened with uh, Stephon how, Diggs last week. And how bad he played. Like, it wasn't like Foles came out and played great. This was the Foles we all thought we were going to see. Now, you're right. You're right about that. They do not have a prop up yet for... Not yet. Well, the Westgate will have a ball. Yeah, Westgate Saturday, will have every Saturday, one of them. Saturday, before we go to the show, Saturday, my goal is to go hit the sports book, get all my bets in Saturday, because everything I've read about and talked to said if you show up Sunday, if you're not too it's going to take you forever. The game, the line's out the door to try to get to the ticket booth. I'm I'm interested in showing up Sunday, relaxed, even kill, ready to chill. I'm ready. I'm ready for game day. I like that. I like that. Uh, we'll go on and say this. Thank you to everybody tuning in on Facebook. We got some first time viewers. We appreciate yeah. you guys. Don't forget to go and check out the podcast on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud. Stitcher, tune in, Google Play, all that good stuff. Subscribe, tell all your buddies about it, share it out. Uh, Chris, tell me this. Do you know what the last NFL team to make a Super Bowl in their home stadium was? Well, yeah, so so this has been talked about all year, and that's kind of the mantra of the, the, Vikings, the Vikings, which is, you know, bring it home. And, and there are, I'm telling you, there are a lot of people. This was the one of the worst matchup decisions was the Jags and the Patriots for ticket brokers. Because the Patriots have been there so many times. That's right. And the Jags don't have that much of a fan base, right? No. So they wanted maybe Falcons, but that's probably not your best bet. Um, really, they want like they want the Eagles or the Vikings. Really, the Vikings is what they're yeah. hoping for. Um, and they wanted either Pittsburgh or, oh, God, what was the other team? Um, the Bills, the Chiefs? Bills? Bills yeah, Chiefs. Chiefs, Bills or Chiefs? So, so I, I don't think any of this matters. I think 80% of the Super Bowl tickets are all corporate. I think it's an event. I think you go no matter who the teams are. Well, but are. For, the, for the brokers, I think that's the biggest thing. Oh, because yeah, you're you, talking about like, the aftermarket ticket yes. guys? Well, screw those guys. Those guys are <laughs> sharks anyway. <laughs> Nobody's crying a river for some bust-ass, off-record ticket brokers that are trying to gouge you for $5,000 a ticket. For fans okay? that want to go watch the I'd team I'd push play. that guy out a window, too. You need to line him up. So that that I'm not worried about. Give me your picks. Oh, you talking about the home field? Uh, home I know, field. I know the Forty Nine ers See, this is one of those things I think is kind of dumb. We'll talk about this in a minute. Home field. I know the Forty Nine ers played in Candlestick Park, and I know there was. Well, no, they a, they didn't play in Candlestick. Oh no, they play, they, but they played, they played in, in San Francisco. Stanford Stadium. Yeah, in Palo Alto. Yeah, and then and Which, then there's how a, crazy is that? Wasn't there a Florida team? The Dolphins played that year. Uh, well, no, I'm talking no. about. The only other one was I know the, Los it's twice. The, the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, they Rose played in Bowl. Super Bowl fourteen. They played in the Rose Bowl, not yep. the Memorial Coliseum. Yep. This was after the seventy nine season. The uh the forty ers was after the eighty four season. I think the 
at their home stadium is is a made up story. It's fake news. Like that's dumb. If if let's say let's say there was a second football stadium in Nashville. Okay. If Tennessee made it, the Titans made it to the Super Bowl and they were hosting it in the other stadium in Nashville. Would it change anything about how crazy the stadium, the city is? No. No. So the fact that they're playing at the same place they play all their home games is completely irrelevant. They're in the same area. It's, I'm you're still you. going to get all the same. So I think that's a made-up story. I do think it's an awesome story that they get a chance to do it, but don't try to claim this is the first time it's ever happened. In, in, in like, years ago, the, the Red Sox – won like their th- and I'm not kidding it was like their third world series that they've won after breaking the curse okay and it was the first one they actually closed the game out in Fenway yeah and they were like it's been 183 years since this has happened I'm thinking you don't get to d- in a sport where you play a back and forth <laughs> series this is my team but I'm I'm smart enough to realize this is a totally made up story yeah and my problem with that is this there are enough really good storylines that sports writers don't need to make up bullcrap stories to make their job easier. I agree. Right now, you're in the balls deep of the play. If if you're a, and this is one thing that I kind of think a lot of people are missing, if if you're middle of the road, you don't have a team to pull for, I think this Vikings story is unbelievable. But the last thing is, is if you're not, let's say you're not a big football fan, but you're one of, and I don't. You're 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 very supportive and inclusive about what's going on in our country and all this stuff. Right. You, you've got a you've got a Muslim owner that has a team in the AFC Championship game. It's a pretty big deal. And that's a I think that's a big deal, man. I think that there are people out there that should be like, you know what? Let's let's ride this team. This is a bastard team anyway. Nobody likes the Jags. They don't have fans. Let's jump on their bandwagon. And they're playing the most hated team in the country, so you've got a little pump from that. Get behind some of these things. I'm pro excitement in football because I love this sport. I don't think it should be made up from just the kings and queens. I think there are good stories everywhere. And and if I was on the NFC side, I'd be rooting for the Vikings. And if I didn't have a dog in the fight and I was on the AFC side, I'd be rooting for the Jags. Yeah. And you draw a line in the sand, you say, let's go, man. This is my team for today. I wouldn't be – I'm not rooting for the Vikings because they will be playing at home. No. I'm rooting for the Vikings because they haven't made it in forever. Well, I, I – I kind of worship so many near the misses. Of Mike Zimmer. I think that guy's a genius. I know you do. The one year the Browns decided to hold Pat and not fire their co- coach after one season, Mike Zimmer was getting the job, and he he was at Cincinnati. He was already in Ohio, and that was a pretty natural progression, and we missed out. It is what it is. So I right. love my example. If you, uh, if you missed Dr. Ridpath on with us earlier, go back and listen to it. The podcast will be up on iTunes uh, for, for Thursday. Um, yeah, I think that's going to wrap this thing up. I'll talk to you next week, brother. I hope you have fun in Vegas, buddy. I'm going to have a blast. All right. That's it. Winning Cures Everything. It's time for the rundown. Remember, check out winningcureseverything.com.